Dear students, the topic of our lecture is systemic lupus erythematosus. I'm Dr. Vartanian, Associate Professor at the Department of Rheumatology of Yerevan State Medical University. This is the general outline of our lecture. We will speak about the definition, epidemiology, pathophysiology, classification and diagnosis, clinical features, lupus-related syndromes, treatment and prognosis of this classical autoimmune disease. So, what is systemic lupus erythematosus or lupus or SLE, how we call it? This is inflammatory autoimmune disorder which affects multiple organs and systems and is characterized by the production of autoantibodies against cell nuclei and its components. So, uh, the epidemiology. A prevalence of lupus is influenced by age, gender, race and genetics. The prevalence is 1 to 2,000 in general population. Peak incidence is from 14 to 45 years. People with black skin are having high predisposition for lupus development. We have female predominance 10 to 1 and it is being explained by estrogen hormones. We know that estrogens are causing decrease in apoptosis of B cells. And then we know that uh, one of the uh, genetic uh, predispositions for lupus is associated with TREX1 uh, gene. Uh, which is more seen in women. And HLA DR3 and other genetic predisposition and family history and severity is equal in males and females. So when we speak about the etiology and pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus, we say that in etiological factors, we have two main domains, two main groups. First are genes, which are linked to lupus, and every stage of pathogenesis of lupus disease is associated with a specific carriage of specific genetic polymorphisms. For example, nuclease is associated with TREX1, clearance of apoptotic cells is uh, associated with complement genes, Immune threshold are FCR2A and FCR3A genes. Presentation of antigens are associated with HLA, DRB1. And, uh, cell signal is associated with PTPN22. Here we speak also about interferon alpha cytokine pathways, etc. So genetic predisposition is playing a huge role in lupus process. The second domain is environment. We know that several environmental factors are playing very high role in development of lupus process. First of all, we speak about UV light, sun radiation. We even have a specific uh, syndrome, specific sign, which is called photosensibilization. So our patients with lupus are very sensitive to sun. And one of the questions that we usually give to our patients uh, gathering the disease history, we ask them, how do you tolerate the sun? And usually our patients will say that we do not tolerate sun well. Some of them will say that they are having sun allergy or something. Viruses. We know that interferon alpha is one of the cytokines which is playing a huge role in lupus pathogenesis. We speak about drugs. We even have a specific uh, uh, lupus associated syndrome, which is called a drug-induced lupus. Some foods and other factors like alcohol and smoking also may play a role in etiology of lupus process. Interactions between susceptibility genes and environmental factors result in abnormal immune responses, which vary between different patients. Those responses may include Activation of innate immunity, dendritic cells, monocyte, macrophages, by DNA, DNA in immune complexes, viral DNA or RNA, and protein self-antigens. This may also cause 
uh, lower the activation thresholds and normal activation pathways in adaptive immunity cells, major T and B lymphocytes. And ineffective regulatory CD4 and CD8 T cells, B cells, and myeloid derived suppressor cells. And in the end, reduced clearance of immune complexes and apoptotic cells. Self antigens, for example, nucleosomal DNA or a protein, RNA protein in SM, Rho, LA, and phospholipids are recognized by the immune system in surface blobs of apoptotic cells. Thus, autoantigens, autoantibodies, and immune complexes persist for a prolonged period of time, allowing inflammation and disease to develop. Immune cell activation is accompanied by increased secretion of pro-inflammatory type 1 and type 2 interferons, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-17, interleukin-6, and B-cell maturation survival cytokines B-lymphocyte stimulator, BLIS or BUF, and IL-10. Upregulation of the genes induced by interferon alpha is a genetic signature in peripheral blood cells of 50 to 60 percent of SLA patients. Decreased production of other cytokines also contribute to lupus erythematosus. Lupus T and natural killer cells fail to produce enough IL-2 and transforming growth factor beta to induce and sustain regulatory CD4 and CD8 T cells. The result of this abnormalities is sustained production of autoantibodies and immune complexes. Pathogenic subsets being to target tissues with activation of complement, leading to release of cytokines, chemokines, vasoactive peptides, oxidants, and proteolytic enzymes. This results in activation of multiple tissue cells, endothelial cells, tissue-fixed macrophages, mesangial cells, podocytes, renotubular epithelial cells, and influx into target tissues of T and B cells, monocyte macrophages, and dendritic cells. In the setting of chronic inflammation, accumulation of growth factors and production of chronic oxidation contribute to irreversible tissue damage, including fibrosis, sclerosis in glomeruli, arteries, lungs, and other tissues. So what are we having clinical, clinical features? Uh, we know that uh, the skin and mucosa are being affected in framework of lupus process very often. We know that more than in 90% of cases, lupus is being manifested and sometimes the, in, we have these skin changes beginning from the onset of lupus process. And we know that in literature there are more than 100 variants of skin and mucosa involvement in framework of lupus. Of course, today we will speak about the most common from them. All skin presentations occurring in case of SLA are divided into two groups. This is acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus or chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. As the most common type of acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus presents the molar rush. Here on these pictures you can see the classical presentation. You will see the fixed erythema flat or rise over the molar eminences. And these rushes are tending to spare the nasolabial folds. On next slide, on left side picture, you can see again a classical malar rush uh, located on face on molar eminences. And on the right sided picture, you can see the hands of a patient with acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus. Here also you can see acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus and here we can notice raised erythema. If you look attentively on the mouth of this patient, you will see that the skin of the lips is irritated and we have rushes uh, around the mouth, which is called chelitis 
or inflammation of the skin of the mouth. The next one is discoid rash. Discoid rash is a classical type of chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. And what we are having here, we are having erythematous raised patches with adherent keratotic scaling and follicular plaquing. And in these cases, we may also have atrophic scarring uh, and in contrast to acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus where usually the rashes are being resolved without scarring, in case of chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus, we usually always are having scarring. Here you can see again the types of discoid rash. Uh, you see on a picture uh, which is from left side, uh, the rashes are uh, located on face. Here are uh, we have here already uh, follicular plaguing, and from right side you see this old woman uh, who is having at the same time she is having new and old uh, rashes, and the rashes which are located over the eyebrows and on nose and uh, below the mouse, you can see uh, the specific scarring. On this slide, you can see the differentiation uh, between acute cutaneous lupus erythematosus and chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. From left side, you see the acute one, and you should know the sparing of nasolabial folds. And from the right side, you can see a chronic cutaneous lupus, you see here a scarring, plucking, and hyperpigmentation. On next picture, you can notice alopecia. Alopecia is again very, uh, very and very common presentation in framework of lupus. And as I told you, one of the first questions that we uh, give to our uh, patients when we suspect lupus, uh, we ask them whether how do you tolerate the sun we are just checking whether the patient is having photosensibilization or no and our second question is do you have alopecia and usually alopecia is present and is being present from the first days of disease sometimes this is manifesting uh, uh, a symptom the next type of uh, skin changes in framework of lupus is uh, subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus, a specific type. And here, uh, usually we have two types of uh, lesions. First, we may have annular target-like rushes, uh, which resemble uh, erythema multiforme. Or case, in other case, we are having Rushes which uh, resemble psoriasis. Uh, we have a strictly, a strictly uh, shaped uh, rushes with sculling, and usually this kind of rushes may uh, resemble psoriasis. And sometimes the patients are being sent to us to rheumatologists by dermatologists when they exclude psoriasis or sometimes uh, antipsoriatic treatment is non-efficacious that's why they suspect that this may be lupus or sometimes uh, the diagnosis of lupus is being done as a result of histological investigation. Here you can see a child and you see uh, the child who is again uh, having annular rashes and this is again subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus. The next type of uh, rashes is follicular plugging from the left side and from the right side you can see very common clinical presentation which is called libido reticularis. Looking on the legs of this patient you can see in the net, the net of vessels or otherwise this is called marble skin and you can see usually arteries inflamed and dilated arteries this slide uh, you can see this change is more expressed and usually the patients 
or having uh, libido reticularis, usually when in a framework of lupus erythematosus, we have antiphospholipid syndrome. We will speak about antiphospholipid syndrome in details later. So what is antiphospholipid syndrome? This is again an autoimmune disorder, which may be primary or secondary. And, uh, and this is usually manifested by high predisposition to thrombosis. Patients who are having antiphospholipid syndrome, they are having thrombosis of different vessels. On next slide, you see lupus paniculitis. What is lupus paniculitis? This is a rather rare, rather rare presentation of uh, lupus erythematosus. It is included in chronic lupus erythematosus presentation, chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus. Please note the arms of the patient. And you see here uh, very expressed pits. So what is usually happening in these cases, the patient develops subcutaneous nodes. Uh, we may have also secondary infection of these nodes. And after the resolving, we may have, we are having here residual pits. This is, these are pitting nodules. And very often these patients are being referred to us by the surgeons. The next uh, one is uh, involvement of mucosa. The most common type of involvement of mucosa is formation of oral or nasopharyngeal ulcers. In contrast to, for example, Bechet syndrome, uh, when uh, these ulcers are very painful, uh, in case of lupus erythematosus, uh, the ulcers are painless and usually are being uh, observed by physicians. Lupus vasculopathy. Here we usually have three types. First is small vessel vasculitis. The second one is Raynaud's phenomenon. And third type is antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. I would like to stop on Raynaud's phenomenon. Here you see whitening on the picture which is located in upper side of the slide. Uh, you can see whitening of fingers. Uh, on the left-sided lower picture, you will see bluish coloring of the fingers. And on the last picture, you will see ischemic necrotic changes. Usually, uh, we speak here, in case of Renault's phenomenon, we speak about uh, digital vasculopathy. Uh, in contrast to systemic sclerosis, when digital vasculopathy is uh, unreversible, here, usually... Uh, this is associated with vasculitis of digital arteries, and uh, if, uh, if we have preserved vessels, we can treat it. And usually, uh, the Raynaud's phenomenon in framework of lupus erythematosus is much more benign in contrast to systemic sclerosis. The next presentation is arthritis musculoskeletal presentation. So the arthritis in contrast to rheumatoid arthritis is non-erosive, transient, symmetrical. It may affect small joints. Deforming is seldom and arthritis is mainly less severe than in rheumatoid arthritis. And sometimes this is the primary first presenting feature of systemic lupus erythematosus. So sometimes and it is very common when a patient, especially a young woman, is coming to us with arthritis. We are checking for markers of different uh, inflammatory diseases of joints, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, etc., and find out nothing. Uh, so in these cases, we diagnose undifferentiated arthritis and begin to treat the patient. Sometimes in months, two, or sometimes it takes years to disease, to lupus disease, to be open, to be manifested. That's why every time when we are having a patient with undifferentiated arthritis, we shouldn't forget uh, about systemic lupus erythematosus as long as arthritis may be the first presentation of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. 
uh, as I told you, usually arthritis in lupus is non-erosive, uh, with exception for Jaku arthropathy, where we may have deformities resembling rheumatoid arthritis. Here you see deformity that if we had rheumatoid arthritis, we would call it swan neck deformity. But when we look attentive uh, on x-ray picture, we can see, of course, here we have uh, subluxations, we have a uxtarticular osteoporosis, but, but we don't see erosions, we don't see expressed subluxations or ankylosis, which will happen, if, which we would see if we would have swan neck deformity in a framework of rheumatoid arthritis. That's why we say that this is non-erosive and reducible uh, problem, because uh, here, we associate this kind of deformities with the involvement of tendons and ligaments, and the role of joints is not so much expressed in contrast to rheumatoid arthritis. So, osteoporosis is again a very uh, common thing uh, in case of uh, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, and um, here we have two main mechanisms. First, the acylene may itself cause osteoporosis from one hand. From the other hand, uh, one of the key treatments in lupus is uh, usage of corticosteroids, and we know that corticosteroids, one of the uh, main side effects of corticosteroids is a development of osteoporosis. The next musculoskeletal presentation of lupus is osteonecrosis, or otherwise called avascular necrosis. So it may be, it may occur with or without history of steroid therapy. It is very often to have a patient with avascular necrosis of femoral head, uh, which is being referred to rheumatologist by orthopedic surgeon. Here from left side you can see a normal femoral head and from the, on the from right side picture, on the right side picture you can see uh, the deformed femoral head with collapse of acetabular part and this is because of uh, decreased uh, blood flow etc. So uh, uh, this is the collapse of the head of femur because of loss of blood supply. Is it caused by vasculitis or no? We don't know yet, but this is not very common uh, presentation of lupus erythematosus, but it may happen. The next clinical feature is involvement of eye. Uh, to tell the truth, uh, eye is organ which is being affected in framework of autoimmune and autoinflammatory disorders very often. And here in lupus also we may have ocular presentations. First of all, we should speak about the conjunctivitis. We may have photophobia in framework of uh, photosensibilization. We may have monocular blindness, which may be transient or permanent. Usually monocular uh, blindness is associated with antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, there may be blurred, blurred vision, and in cases where we have uh, degeneration of the nerves of retina uh, due to occlusion and uh, inflammation of retinal blood vessels, we may have cotton wool spots on retina. Involvement of the lung. All structural parts of the lungs may be involved in lupus process. The most common presentation is pleuritis or pleural effusion. We also may have infiltrates of lung tissue and discoid atelectasis, as well as acute lupus pneumonitis. There also may be pulmonary hemorrhage and in the end we would have pneumofibrosis causing restrictive lung disease. If there is antiphospholipid syndrome in a framework of lupus, uh, the thrombosis of the branches of pulmonary artery is also a very common presentation. Cardiac symptoms. All layers of the heart may be involved in the process of systemic lupus erythematosus. The most common presentation is pericarditis. 
It may be manifested clinically, but in majority of cases, it has it is being just found out on echocardiography, and it is asymptomatic. Myocardium is also being involved in lupus process, causing cardiac arrhythmias, cardiac failure, and endocardium is also being involved. Usually, mitral and aortic valves are being involved primarily, and there is a specific type of lupus endocarditis, which is called Liebman Sachs endocarditis. Coronary arteries may be involved by themselves as, as arteries in framework of vasculitis, but if we are having antiphospholipid syndrome in a framework of systemic lupus erythematosus, we also may have thrombosis and thromboembolism of coronary arteries. Here you see, this is very famous picture, you see the endocardium and here we have non-infective thrombotic endocarditis and these things which you see, these are nodular vegetations along the line of closure and extending onto corda tendine. Here you see corda tendine and here you see the thrombotic masses. This is classical Liebman Sachs endocarditis. Uh, the next Clinical presentation is hematological disorder. Uh, we know that in framework of lupus process, we may have a synthesis of autoantibodies against uh, the cells uh, of the blood. That's why we, we will have anemia, usually of hemolytic type. We are having leukopenia, mainly lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia. That's why. Patients with lupus are often being sent uh, to rheumatologists by hematologists because if uh, CBC is showing anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia all together or, for example, uh, separated, isolated anemia, isolated leukopenia, isolated thrombocytopenia, and hematologist is excluding primary hematologic disease, Usually, they refer patients to, uh, to rheumatology. Both ventral and peripheral uh, nervous system may be affected uh, in lupus erythematosus. And involvement of central nervous system, otherwise called cerebrovasculitis, is an indication for aggressive treatment of lupus. In case of uh, cerebrovasculitis, uh, the clinical presentations vary from headache and personality changes up to psychosis, seizures, stroke, chorea. You may also have pseudotumor cerebri, transverse myelitis, and of course peripheral neuropathy may also be there. Total uh, of 19 manifestations and even more are described in uh, framework of cerebrovasculitis and involvement of peripheral nervous system in the framework of systemic lupus erythematosus. The lupus nephritis is uh, one of the most severe and serious types of involvement in case of lupus erythematosus and nephritis, lupus nephritis remains the most frequent cause of death of disease-related death. Usually it develops in up to 50% of patients. 10% of SLE patients are going to dialysis or transplant. Uh, I will give you an example. All of you know a uh, very famous actress and singer, Selena Gomez. Selena Gomez is also uh, also having uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, and if I'm not mistaken, two or three years ago she underwent uh, transplantation of kidney. Uh, the hallmark uh, clinical finding of uh, lupus nephritis is proteinuria, and of course advancing renal failure is complicating assessment of SLA disease activity. So. How is it being manifested? In majority of cases, it is asymptomatic, but it is asymptomatic and we should perform urinalysis to find out proteinuria in lupus patient and suspect that this patient is having, is maybe having lupus nephritis. 
So, but what can we also have? We may have gross hematuria, we may have gross proteinuria with development of nephrotic syndrome, we may have acute renal failure, we may have hypertension, and sometimes, uh, so this is the worst variant in case of acute course of lupus when the patient is coming to us already with end-stage renal failure. Every time when we confirm that a patient is having lupus nephritis, it is not enough just to confirm it by urinalysis or check of creatinine level in the blood. Every time we should know which histological type is happening here. Why is it so important? Because uh, according to classification, there are six histological types of lupus nephritis, and these classes may be manifested clinically by the same way. For example, all of them may be manifested by a nephrotic syndrome, by the, by, uh, but by the treatment peculiarities and by prognosis, these types, these classes are different. So, according to classification, there are six classes of uh, lupus nephritis. First is a minimal mesangial glomerular nephritis, class 2 is mesangial proliferative glomerular nephritis, class 3 is focal and segmental glomerular nephritis, class 4 diffuse glomerular nephritis, class 5 membranose glomerular nephritis, and class 6 is advanced sclerotic lupus nephritis. These histological types are very different, either by histological presentation or by prognosis and the further treatment. It is known that class 1, class 2, and class 5 are benign types of, glomerul of lupus glomerulonephritis, and uh, usually the treatment is not so aggressive and the effect of the treatment uh, is very good. In contrast to this, class 3, class 4, and class 6 glomerulonephritis have bad prognosis. So if we have class 6, so if there is advanced sclerotic lupus nephritis, in this case, uh, there is even no sense to perform active immunosuppressive treatment. We just perform symptomatic treatment and prepare our patients for uh, dialysis and transplant. And if class 3 or class 4 are confirmed, so these patients are undergoing the most aggressive immunosuppressive treatment even possible to prevent uh, terminal uh, renal disease. Because I will repeat that the involvement of kidney remains the main cause of death in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. Gastrointestinal manifestations as well as hepatic manifestation are uncommon in case of lupus erythematosus. Anyway, there may be severe abdominal pain syndromes in SLE, which often indicate mesenteric vasculitis resembling medium vessel vasculitis, polar arteritis nodosa. In these cases, we suspect that the cause for a mesenterial vessel involvement is vasculitis. But there is another thing also. If the patients with uh, systemic lupus erythematosus are having concomitant antiphospholipid syndrome, acute abdominal pain may be associated not with mesenteric vasculitis, but with thrombosis of mesenterial vessels. So every time when there is a patient with ASLE experiencing acute abdominal pains, the patient should be checked for presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. Diverticulitis may be masked by steroids, that's why we should be very attentive to this. Hepatic abnormalities are more often due to therapy than to ASLE itself. Investigations. What can we find out in laboratory results? First of all, in CBC, in complete blood count, we can find out anemia, leukopenia, lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia. In urinalysis, if, if we are having lupus nephritis, we may find out hematuria, proteinuria, glandular cast, etc. 
But of course, all these changes are non-specific. We have specific immunological findings uh, in case of lupus erythematosus, and uh, I will tell you that there is no logical uh, explanation of all these things. So you should remember these types of antibodies by heart. So first of all, we speak about anti-nuclear antibodies or anti-nuclear factor, which is uh, uh, approximately in more than 90% of patients with lupus, these ANA antibodies are being positive. This is very sensitive, but non-specific uh, marker in case of lupus. We have more specific marker anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, or the thing which we call anti-DSDNA, uh, which is again sensitive and much more specific uh, immunologic marker in contrast to uh, ANA. In case of lupus process, we can find out four RNA-associated antibodies, and one of these antibodies is the most specific antibody in case of lupus. This is anti-SM antibodies. We may also find anti rho SSA, anti-LA SSB. Usually these two types of antibodies may be present in lupus, but these antibodies are more specific for Sjogren's disease or primary Sjogren's syndrome. We have we may have antibodies to RMP or ribonucleoprotein, which these antibodies may be present in lupus process, but uh, in majority of cases, this type of antibodies are accompanying mixed disease of connective tissue. So, antiphospholipid antibodies. What are we having here? Here we may have prolonged lupus anticoagulant. So, what is happening here? We are having antibodies to coagulation factors, and that's why we have prolongation of this lupus anticoagulant. Lupus anticoagulant is a, a type of is uh, roughly said this is coagulation marker and because of this we have also prolonged APTT. We have two main specific autoantibodies in case of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is anticardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies. We will have depressed serum complement and usually in case of drug-induced lupus we may have antihistone. Here you see all these type of antibodies are listed. In the end, you will have all these lectures and you will see um, the short characteristic of these antibodies. I would like first to stop on these anti rho SSA antibodies. Uh, they, these antibodies are not very specific for SLE, but they are they may be associated with subacute cutaneous lupus and to neonatal lupus with congenital heart block associated with decreased risk of nephritis. So every time when we are having a woman who is having lupus erythematosus and who is pregnant, by all means, we are checking anti rho SSA. And I'd like to stop on this anti-ribosomal antibodies. So uh, in some series, uh, the positive test in serum is being associated with depression of psychosis in case of CNS lupus. Here you can see that in majority of cases, we in 98% of cases, we have positive antinuclear antibodies, and in 70% of cases, we have positive anti-DSDNA. Of course, we say that the most specific marker is anti-SM, uh, anti smith body antibodies, but the sensitivity is not very high. Sensitivity is about 25%. Specificity is very high, but sensitivity is low. That's why usually we say to check and to confirm lupus process, we need antinuclear antibodies and anti-DSDNA antibodies in majority of cases. So let's speak about diagnostic criteria of lupus erythematosus. In the literature, you may find out a lot of uh, variants of classification criteria of lupus erythematosus in your Harrison 90s edition, which is the main uh, book uh, on which should your knowledge be based. Uh, here you, there you can find out a SLEEK classification criteria or Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinic classification criteria, and to tell the truth, uh, on my opinion, uh, these criteria are the best. The criteria are divided in two domains, 
This is clinical. These are clinical criteria. Acute cutaneous lupus, chronic cutaneous lupus, oral or nasal ulcers, non-scarring alopecia, arthritis, serositis, renal changes, neurologic changes, hemolytic anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. And here we have immunologic criteria. Here we have ANA, anti-DSDNA, anti-SM, anti-antiphospholipid antibodies, low complement, and direct Coombs test do not count, we shouldn't count it in the presence of hemolytic anemia. How to confirm the diagnosis? We should have four and more criteria, and from these four criteria, at least one should be clinical criteria, and at least one should be immunologic criteria. In further two slides, you will see the explanation of peculiarities of clinical criteria included in sleep classification criteria. I would like only to stop on presentation and explanation of cutaneous uh, presentations of SLE. So what do we mean when we say that a patient is having acute lupus or subacute uh, cutaneous lupus erythematosus? Which lesions are included in this group? Acute cutaneous lupus is lupus malar rash, or otherwise called butterfly rash, uh, bullous lupus, toxic ep epidermal necrolysis variant of SLE, maculopapular lupus rash, photosensitive lupus rash, in absence of dermatomyositis. What is subacute cutaneous lupus? I have already told you that here we have two variants, or either this is non-indurated psoriasis form, and or annular polycyclic lesions that resolve without scarring, although occasionally with post-inflammatory dispigmentation or teleangiectasis. So what is chronic lupus, uh, cutaneous lupus erythematosus? Here we speak about the classic discoid rash, localized above the neck or generalized above and below the neck, hypertrophic lupus, lupus paniculitis, lupus profundis, mucosal lupus, lupus erythematosus tumidus, uh, and other forms of chronic cutaneous lupus. To tell the truth, the chronic cutaneous lupus, uh, especially discoid lupus, uh, in these cases, sometimes the diagnosis is confirmed by histological presentation because in chronic cutaneous lupus erythematosus, sometimes the immunological uh, uh, results of immunological investigations may be negative. On this slide, you can see the explanation for other clinical criteria included in SLIC classification criteria, including involvement of serous tissues, kidneys, CNS and peripheral nervous system, and involvement of the blood. Uh, so, when we speak about the immunologic criteria, we should have ANA level above laboratory reference range. We should have anti-DS DNA, and this is very important to say, we should have it two-fold of reference range if tested by ELISA. So, every anti-DS DNA is not a positive DS DNA, which may be included in classification criteria. So anti-SM, uh, antiphospholipid antibody uh, positivity, uh, this is determined by positive test for lupus anticoagulant, false positive test of rapid plasma reagent, may do more high titer anti-cardiolipin antibodies, positive test result for anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies, low complement and direct Coombs test. Differential diagnosis. Every time when we are having a patient with lupus, it is very, very important to, to confirm the lupus process. Uh, because if we have confirmed the lupus, we should treat the patient with immunosuppressive drugs. And so when we are not sure, it is really very scary. So. What should we take into account when we perform the differential diagnosis of lupus? So it is very, almost too broad to consider 
because we have a high number of clinical manifestations. So we should uh, differentiate it from other rheumatic diseases, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's cyst syndrome, systemic sclerosis, dermatomyositis. We should differentiate from non-rheumatic diseases, which is much more important. So this is HIV, endocarditis, viral infections, hematologic malignancies, vasculitis, and other uh, cause of nephritis and uh, immune thrombocytopenia. And of course, we should think also about the overlap uh, syndromes. Uh, so undifferentiated connective tissue disease or mixed connective tissue disease. So we have several lupus related syndromes. First of all, we should speak about the drug induced lupus. Here uh, in your Harrison 90s edition, you have a very long list of drugs which may cause uh, drug induced lupus, but usually we speak about uh, hydrolysin, isoniazid, and prokinamic. So, male female ratio is equal. Uh, nephritis and CNS abnormalities are rare. We have normal complement and no anti DSDNA antibodies. We may have sometimes anti histone antibodies, but anti DSDNA antibodies are negative. And usually, symptoms result when we stop the drug. During my talk about systemic lupus erythematosus, you heard a lot about antiphospholipid syndrome. And now is the time to understand what antiphospholipid syndrome is. Antiphospholipid syndrome is an autoantibody mediated acquired thrombophilia, which is characterized by recurrent arterial or venous thrombosis and or pregnancy morbidity. The major autoantibodies detected in patient sera are directed against phospholipid binding plasma proteins, especially uh, against uh, cardiolipin, against beta-2 glycoprotein, and um, against prothrombin. Another group of autoantibodies termed lupus anticoagulant elongate clotting times in vitro. This elongation is not corrected by adding normal plasma to the detection system. Patients with antiphospholipid syndrome often possess antibodies recognized in tri trypanem and pallidum cholesterol complexes, which are detected as biologic false positive serologic test for syphilis. Antiphospholipid syndrome may occur alone. In this case, we will call it primary antiphospholipid syndrome, or it may come in association with any other autoimmune disease, secondary antiphospholipid syndrome. In the majority of cases, antiphospholipid syndrome accompany systemic lupus erythematosus. Catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome is defined as a rapidly progressive thromboembolic disease involving simultaneously three or more organs, organ systems, or tissues leading to corresponding functional defects. To confirm the presence of antiphospholipid syndrome, we need specific criteria, and these criteria are called Sapporo criteria. It is very important to confirm antiphospholipid syndrome strictly, because either hypodiagnosis or hyperdiagnosis in is unwanted uh, option in case of antiphospholipid syndrome. So we have criteria, Sapporo criteria, which include two domains, clinical criteria and immunologic criteria. So which are criteria are clinical. So in clinical criteria, first of all, we speak about the vascular thrombosis, which is one or more clinical episode of arterial venous or small vessel thrombosis is in any tissue or organs. The second one is pregnancy morbidity. So this is very common thing, especially in primary antiphospholipid syndrome, when a young woman gets married, gets easily pregnant, but she's having pregnancy morbidity. And in these cases, usually, these kind of patients are being referred to rheumatologists by reproductive gynecology. What pregnancy morbidities are included in antiphospholipid syndrome? First of all, one or more unexplained deaths of a morphologically normal fetus at or beyond the 10th week of gestation. Second one is one or more premature births of a morphologically normal neonate before the 
34th week of gestation because of anclampsia or severe preeclampsia defined according to standard definitions or recognized features of placental insufficiency. Or third type is three or more unexplained consecutive spontaneous abortions before the 10th week of gestation with maternal anatomic or hormonal abnormalities and uh, paternal and maternal chromosomal causes excluded. Next domain is laboratory criteria of antiphospholipid syndrome. Here we have three criteria. First is anticardiolipin antibodies of IgG or IgM isotype in serum or plasma present in medium or high titer on two or more occasions at least 12 weeks apart. Second is lupus anticoagulant present in plasma on two or more occasions at least 12 weeks apart. And anti beta 2 glycoprotein antibodies of IgG or IgM isotype in serum or plasma again present on two or more occasions at least 12 weeks apart. Definite antiphospholipid syndrome is present if at least one of the clinical criteria and one of three laboratory criteria are met, with the first measurement of the laboratory test performed at least 12 weeks from the clinical manifestation. The treatment of systemic lupus erythematosus. The mode of the treatment of systemic lupus erythematosus depends on the severity of disease. According to this, we are dividing the clinical presentation of SLE into three groups, mild cases, cases of intermediate severity, and severe life-threatening cases. In, in mild cases, uh, which are uh, usually manifested by mild skin or joint involvement, we would use NSAIDs, local treatment, it means local corticosteroidal ointments, or creams, and sunscreens and hydroxychloroquine. In cases of intermediate severity, so if we are having serositis, cytopenia, marked skin or joint involvement, we will add to our treatment oral corticosteroids. Usually methylprednisone is preferred option, so we use either prednisone or methylprednisone for everyday use, uh, but according to opinion of some investigators, methylprednisone is preferred option because methylprednisone has less mineral corticoid activity in contrast to prednisone. Daily dose is from 12 to 64 milligrams per day. In these cases, uh, if uh, the activity of hydroxychloroquine is counted as insufficient, usually we add azetoprim or metotrexate or biological preparation. Uh, in these cases, in cases of intermediate severity, we choose belimumab. What is belimumab? Belimumab is uh, presents as monoclonal antibodies against BOF or BLIS, B cell activating factor. We talked about it before. So, uh, what if we are having severe life-treatening lupus? So we confirm severe life-treatening lupus if we have carditis, nephritis, systemic vasculitis, cerebral manifestations, etc. In these cases, we will use high-dose intravenous corticosteroids, the thing which we call pulse therapy, uh, plus IV cyclophosphamide in some cases we add plasmapheresis or IV immunoglobulin, or instead of cyclophosphamide, if we don't want to use it or it is toxic, we may use mycophone phenylalmorphetil, and according to uh, last guidelines of treatment, rituximab uh, is also added uh, for treatment of severe lupus as lupus nephritis, cerebral vasculitis, etc., uh, as an alternative treatment to cyclophosphamide. What is rituximab? This is anti-B cell drug. Uh, this, these are monoclonal antibodies against 
CD20 receptors of B cells. In some cases of nephritis, instead of cyclophosphamide or morphetilmicophenolat or rituximab, uh, cyclosporine uh, may also be used. So, how would we treat antiphospholipid syndrome? Uh, usually, uh, we need anticoagulation, and in majority of cases, we need long-term uh, per oral anticoagulation. The drug of choice is warfarin. Warfarin is an old drug, it is teratogenic. If when we use warfarin, we should control uh, the coagulation by prothrombin index, prothrombin time, and INR. Uh, and uh, last years, when we had, um, the, when the Rivaroxaban or Xarelto. Uh, which is the brand name of Rivaroxaban, had entered uh, the pharmaceutical market, uh, a lot of rheumatologists uh, began to change uh, warfarin to Rivaroxaban. And the later studies had shown that Rivaroxaban is not able to stop the further formation of thrombi in patients with uh, with antiphospholipid syndrome, especially when the patients are triple positive. What, what does it mean, triple positive, uh, in case of antiphospholipid syndrome? Triple positivity is when the same patient is having positive anticardiolipin antibodies, positive beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies, and are having prolonged lupus anticoagulant. So when there is a pregnancy, warfarin is not used, in this case, we are using subcutaneous low molecular weight heparins, uh, like for example, anoxiparin or fraxiparin and aspirin. Uh, so this is the usual approach uh, when a woman with antiphospholipid syndrome is pregnant. So lupus and pregnancy. So it is no longer contraindicated. So uh, we shouldn't change our therapy unless we are using any fetal cytotoxic drug. For example, if we use cyclophosphamide or methotrexate or warfarin, we know that these drugs are fetotoxic, that's why we should change. But uh, for, for contrast, we know that corticosteroids in low and middle doses are allowed, uh, hydroxychloroquine is allowed, uh, azathioprine is allowed, uh, that's why we can uh, monitor, we can allow our patients uh, with lupus erythematosus get pregnant, but they should be under tight control, and we should choose the drugs which are not toxic during the pregnancy. And uh, complications usually of pregnancy are related to renal failure, so when the patient is having involvement of kidney, lupus nephritis pregnancy uh, usually is not contraindicated, but we say that in case of present lupus nephritis, this woman may have complications during pregnancy. So if we have antiphospholipid syndrome, so this is a pregnancy with risk, and if we have positive rho SSA and LA SSA antibodies, because in these cases we anticipate that the fetus, uh, that newborn, uh, may have uh, neo neonatal lupus uh, syndrome. So, how to control the treatment? So, how do we do this? So we use um, general markers of inflammation, usually ESR, CRP, and they are probably useful for as general markers uh, to, to see the disease activity. If our patient is having cytopenia, of course, we use CBC. Sometimes, in some cases, in some patients, complement levels and anti-DNA antibodies may correlate to disease activity. But sometimes they are not very practical because you know that these tests are much more expensive than the general tests, and that's why it is really uh, not very convenient to repeat these tests every month. We may repeat them once or three months, once or six months, but usually we use uh, ESR, ESR, CRP, and the general presentation of patient to assess uh, the condition of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. 
So the prognosis, usually it is unpredictable course. So the patient may come to you with uh, skin changes and up to the end of, of, of the life, uh, the patient will not have any other presentation of lupus. In some cases, uh, the patient is presented with presenting with acute lupus already on first admission. The patient is having skin, uh, lung, blood, kidney, etc. And of course, we begin very serious treatment uh, of this patient. And sometimes, we, in case of acute course of lupus, we even, uh, in case of involvement of internal organs, we may also lose our patients. Uh, in other cases, we may have subacute course of disease. So. Uh, on the first admission, patient is having skin changes. On second, is having blood changes. On third, is having uh, lung changes. On fourth, is having renal changes. So that's it. So every time when we are having patients with lupus, we never know what will happen. That's why we should be very attentive, and the patient should be very compliant and should be very uh, attentive to to him, him or herself. So the compliance is one of the most important uh, points in, in, uh, in the treatment of systemic lupus erythematosus. So 10 years survival uh, usually exceeds 85% if, of course, the patient is not having cerebral vasculitis or uh, lupus nephritis. So most SLE patients die from renal failure or secondary infection, and the infection is usually related to the immunosuppressive therapy. So what we also recommend, we recommend smoking cessation, flu shots, pneumovax every five years, and preventive cancer screening recommendations for our patients. Thank you for your attention.